When you perform echocardiography in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, try to put yourself in the driving seat of the referring physician. Try to answer the question as to what is the true diagnosis of the patient? Does he really have dilated cardiomyopathy? What is the cause of the disease? How severely is the patient really affected? What is his prognosis and can you get clues as to how to treat the patient or how to optimize medical therapy? Here's a patient with significantly reduced left ventricular function. Even though it seems apparent that the patient has dilated cardiomyopathy, it could just as well be coronary artery disease or valvular heart disease. So also look at the regional wall motion and also at the, the valves to see if another cause can be found in the echocardiogram. When you look at left ventricular function in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy, you will find extremes. You can see the patient here on the right who has very severely reduced left ventricular function. So, a matter of fact, the patient died only months after recording this echocardiogram. Or you can have patients who only have subtle changes, such as this patient here on the left, who only had a mildly dilated left ventricle and only mildly reduction in left ventricular function. Here are some practical issues how to quantify size and function. Here's a patient where I want to show you some practical issues when you assess left ventricular size and function. Let's first start with the parasternal long axis view and just by looking at this view you can clearly appreciate that there is significantly reduced left ventricular function. But also take a look at the mitral valve. We have a myopathic motion of the mitral valve. It does not seem to open completely, but not because it is stenotic, but simply because we have low, low output or low flow. And the same is actually also true for the aortic valve. If you take a look at the aortic valve, we can place an MO through the valve. You can see that there seems to be almost premature closure of the valve. There's a slope here, which means we don't have a very high cardiac output. What else you can see in the M mode is we have an aortic root which hardly moves. So there are no large excursions. This also correlates with the reduction in left ventricular function. If we take a look at the short axis view, you can see that there is global dysfunction, but certain regions seem to be even more hypocontractile. The septum here, and then probably also the inferior septum and maybe also the anterior wall. But now let's go to the four chamber view. So here is the four chamber view. Try to get as much of the apex as possible, remember. And here we can see that the patient has a significantly dilated left ventricle. We can just perform a simple measurement of 67, which is of course, too large. The volume of this patient is over 250 milliliters. And ejection fraction is below 20%, as a matter of fact. Again, look at the motion of the mitral valve. You can see that it doesn't open completely. And if we look at the regional wall motions, again, we see that there are regional differences. Even though the patient for sure has dilated cardiomyopathy, he has a normal angiogram. And we have, see a wall motion abnormality here. This part of the inferior wall is actually akinetic. And also the posterior lateral wall seems to be less contractile than the remaining portions. Also take a look at these trabeculations here. Maybe there is some rudimentary form of hypertrabeculation here. And finally, also take a look at the aortic flow. See, we have very short and abbreviated systolic flow, and the velocity is not very high either. It's only 0 0.7, 0 0.8 meters per second. So if you put all these things together, then we can see a patient who has significantly reduced left ventricular function. He has a dilated cardiomyopathy, even though there are regional wall motion differences. And this patient is here because we are assessing him for heart transplantation.
there are a number of diagnostic challenges. One is the left bundle branch block. I want you to take a look at these two image clips of the same patient and then decide for yourself if you think that left ventricular function is normal or abnormal. Well, to give you the background, this is an echocardiogram of an athlete who was able to participate in the marathon. So the patient has normal left ventricular function even though it appears to be reduced. And this is very typical for left bundle branch block. Now we do not know if left bundle branch block is in reality some expression of disease in this patient or if left bundle branch block will sooner or later lead to myocardial disease in this patient. Nevertheless, keep in mind such patients always appear to have a worse left ventricular function as they actually do. Here's another example. Take a look at the two chamber view and the three chamber view. Does the patient have globally reduced left ventricular function or segmentally reduced function? If you take a look at the inferior wall, you will note that in reality, the contractile function is less, the inferior wall hardly moves, especially if you compare it to the anterior wall. And this is also true for the posterior wall. You see, the basal and mid portions of the posterior lateral wall don't appear to contract as much as the anterior septum. So the question is, does the patient have ischemic cardiomyopathy or dilated cardiomyopathy? So what we see is a completely normal left coronary artery and also a normal right coronary artery. So the patient does not have coronary artery disease. So keep in mind, often patients with dilated cardiomyopathy also have some degree of regional differences with respect to their myocardial function. And we know that especially in the end stages of ischemic cardiomyopathy, it is often very difficult to distinguish the two. Here's an example of a patient with reduced LVF who also has LVH. The patient, however, does not have dilated cardiomyopathy. If we look at the aortic valve, we can see that it is calcified. The patient in reality has aortic stenosis, and there's also some degree of aortic regurgitation. To quantify the severity of disease, we can either look at the size, in particular the volume, or at left ventricular function. Here are some examples. This is an MO tracing where you can see that the left ventricle is significantly enlarged and that we only have a moderately decrease in the diameter during systole, in other words, a poor contractile function. We already know from the chapter on LV chambers that we can assess left ventricular function visually. This is an example of a patient who has significantly reduced left ventricular function. But there's also another way of looking at LV function. By looking at the post wave Doppler in the LVOT, we can assess the amount of blood which passes through the aortic valve. And this is an example of a patient who has a very low velocity of only 0.5 meters per second, which means the patient already has low output. If we take a look at the M mode across the aortic valve in patients who have significantly reduced left ventricular function, we also see a very typical pattern. We see that there is a premature and early closure of the aortic valve simply due to the reduction in flow across the valve. Here's an example of a patient with normal LVF. You see normal opening of the aortic cusps, opposed to this patient here who has a reduction in LVF where you see premature closure. Certainly M mode cannot be used to quantify LVF, but it's a nice sign which at least you can interpret if you know that it happens in the case of low output. There are a number of additional findings in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. For example, very often will you find an increase in left atrial size. However, as you can see in this example, the left atrium does not necessarily have to be very large. In this patient, it could mean that the patient has a good prognosis, simply because it could mean that left atrial filling pressure is not elevated. Practically always will you find some degree of diastolic dysfunction, and usually you will find at least some degree of elevated filling pressure. In the following demonstration, you will see how to assess the left atrial size. In patients with cardiomyopathy, it is also important to look at the atria. We will now take a look at the atria and at the size of the atria. I will do this by looking at the four-chamber view. And 
in the 2D image, you will see that the atria are not significantly enlarged. We can get an approximation of the size by performing a 2D measurement here from the annulus down to the roof of the left atrium. And you see that the left atrium is actually almost of normal size. To confirm this measurement, I would perform an area measurement of the left atrium. Okay, close the sector here. And we get 26 square centimeters, which just shows that the left atrium is not significantly enlarged and almost of normal size. Now, this is an important finding also in the setting because it does show that the patient is probably not at increased risk of elevate, uh, of, of developing atrial fibrillation and uh, that it does show that the patient has a good prognosis uh, based on the size of the left atrium. From the chapter on diastolic dysfunction, we already know that diastolic dysfunction relates to left ventricular filling pressures. And elevated left ventricular filling pressure means symptoms and a poor prognosis. So take a look at diastolic dysfunction and you will see how the patients are actually doing. Which patient has less symptoms? Is it the patient on the left who has impaired relaxation or the patient on the right who has a restricted filling pattern? Well, obviously the patient on the left has lower filling pressures and therefore less symptoms, even though if you look at the echocardiogram here on the top, this patient seems to have a more severe form of dilatation than this patient here on the right. So what about mitral regurgitation and dilated cardiomyopathy? Well, MR is actually a fairly frequent finding in these patients. It is usually caused by annual dilatation and also by changes in the geometry of the left ventricle, which cause incompetence. However, there's no strict relationship between the size of the left ventricle and the degree of MR, even though you will tend to see more MR the larger the ventricle gets. Here on the left, you see a patient with a mild MR, and here on the right, a patient with significant MR. And significant MR is also related with a poor prognosis, simply because MR itself causes volume overload, which is not good for the ventricle. It's also important to look at the valves in patients with cardiomyopathy. Let's take a look at the mitral valve. First of all, we can see that the mitral valve does not open the way it usually does, but it has more a myopathic motion caused by the low cardiac output. And if we put the color inside, we see that there is some degree of mitral regurgitation, which is not very significant. We can appreciate that nicely both in the four and also in the two chamber view as well as the apical long axis. So there is not much much regurgitation in this case which is an important finding simply because it does show that the patient does not have additional strain on the left ventricle put on because of regurgitation. So there is no additional volume overload, which is an important prognostic factor also in this setting. Here's a review of the contributing factors which explain the variability in the degree of mitral regurgitation. The shape of the mitral valve seems to play a role, the size of the annulus, the tenting area, in other words, the displacement of the mitral valve, left ventricular function, the degree of left ventricular afterload, and also the synchrony. But remember, MR is a very important contributing factor which can bring the ship of dilated cardiomyopathy to sync. What else do you see? Yeah. What else is important? Right ventricular function. And actually, right ventricular function correlates better with prognosis and symptoms than left ventricular function. Here on the left, you see a patient who has a fairly small right ventricle, which is almost hyperdynamic. This patient was doing fine. Here on the right, you see a patient with a dilated right ventricle with poor right ventricle function, and this patient already had symptoms of right heart failure and was doing not so good. So keep in mind, RVF is important for prognosis and for symptoms. It is equally important to look at the right ventricle when we look at patients with cardiomyopathy. So we'll start with the four-chamber view.
and focus to the right ventricle. And you can nicely see that despite the very large left ventricle, the size of the right ventricle is fairly normal. It's actually almost smaller than normal. If we measure the diameter, 24, 25 milliliters, so millimeters. So this is a completely normal right ventricular size. And in the 2D image, you also see that the lateral wall is contracting quite nicely. So this is also normal right ventricular function. This is an important finding in the setting of cardiomyopathy because it very closely correlates with the symptom of the patient. So if the patient still has normal right ventricular function, he is usually still in a fairly good compensated state. Let's also look at tricuspid regurgitation, which is only mild. And we already recorded the tricuspid regurgitation signal, which is this here. And when we quantified pulmonary pressure, we found that the gradient is quite low, 39. So if we estimate left right atrial pressure to be somewhere in the range of 10 uh, millimeters mercury, we would get maybe a systolic pulmonary pressure of 50 millimeters mercury, which is also not very high. This diagram by GEO, which was published in the year 2000 in the American Journal of Cardiology, nicely shows how important right ventricular function is for prognosis. If you measure RVF with the help of TAPSE, you can see that those patients who have a TAPSE of less than 14 have a much worse prognosis than those who have an excursion of the tricuspid annual plane above 14 millimeters. So again, keep in mind, RVF is very important. Pulmonary artery pressure is equally important. It gives you valuable prognostic information and it actually correlates quite nicely with symptoms. If, for example, you have a patient who has elevated pulmonary artery pressure, as in this tracing here, and he tells you that he does not have any symptoms or only mild symptoms, then either you made some miscalculation or you recorded the wrong signal or the patient is simply not telling the truth. In addition, it is also valuable to monitor treatment and to see what the effect of medical therapy, for example, is if you give the patient diuretics. At the beginning of the presentation, I already mentioned the issue of dyssynchrony. Dyssynchrony is usually caused by left bundle branch block, which is fairly frequent in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. We also know that the width of the QRS complex correlates with left ventricular function. In other words, the poorer left ventricular function gets, the wider the QRS complex gets, and also the more dyssynchrony you have. In other words, dyssynchrony is a marker of severity of disease. Dyssynchrony is a very inefficient way of contracting. You can see this in this patient. You will note that there's a biphasic contraction of the septum and that different parts of the myocardium contract at different time points. You do not need any fancy measurements. You can see that in the 2D image already. We will spend more time about dyssynchrony later when we talk about the role of echocardiography in selecting patients and also in following these patients. Finally, I want you to be aware that patients who have a reduction in left ventricular function, such as those with dilated cardiomyopathy, have an increased risk of thromboembolism. You can have thrombi either in the left ventricle or in the atrium, specifically in the left atrial appendage. Here in this patient who also has atrial fibrillation, this is a TE study, but you also see thrombi on occasion also in the right ventricle. This diagram shows you the risk of left ventricular thrombus and cardiomyopathy as it was found in the SOLVE trial. What we see is that we have an elevated risk which depends also on the degree of left ventricular function. In other words, the poorer left ventricular function is, the higher the risk is. This is true for men and even more so for women which have an even higher risk. Here's an example, a parasternal long axis view in a patient with significantly reduced left ventricular function where you can see a highly mobile thrombus which protrudes far into the left ventricle. 